Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Samantha Politics. As usual, we have an amazing feminist guest on our show tonight, uh, Diana Mao, the president and co-founder of the Nomi Network, which works to alleviate human trafficking in the US and in Asia. Super excited to have her here, especially in light of the murders of Asian American women last week in Georgia. In other news today, Dr. Rachel Levin, the new assistant health secretary, became the first openly transgender person to get Senate confirmation to a federal role, which is really exciting. I think the Biden administration and the range of people that they're nominating from uh, Deb Holland as the first Native American to uh, the first Latino to run Homeland Security. It's really exciting just to see diversity in the government. Uh, and in terms of representing, you know, all of the different types of people that there are in U.S. instead of just having a bunch of white men running everything like usual or like under the Trump administration. Uh, so the second half of the show after Diana leaves us is going to focus on why America has so many goddamn mass shootings. So don't go away. That will be our second half of the show. But the first half, we're going to talk about what exactly are the links between the sexual fetish, 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 Chization of Asian American women or of Asian women in general, um, hate crimes and mass shootings. Now, as we covered last week, hate crimes against Asian Americans have more than doubled during the pandemic. This was definitely uh, added to by Trump and his rhetoric of, you know, blaming that, you know, calling it the Kung flu and blaming it on, you know, China. He doesn't pronounce. China um, and blaming things on China uh, and, and this, you know, this perception of uh, China as being the source of the coronavirus uh, and, you know, and then an extension of people having to be at home and people not having work and all of these reasons all got kind of lumped onto Asian people. Uh, and there's been a tremendous rise in hate crimes, really, really terrifying. So I want to, um, so I want to also talk about human trafficking for a second because Diana runs an organization that has to do with human trafficking and there's a link between human trafficking, massage parlors, nail salons, and other places like that that sometimes end up being used as fronts for human trafficking, particularly sex trafficking. So I worked at a human trafficking NGO about wow 10 years ago dating myself uh, and I remember just being so surprised about how many people are in modern slavery today? There's 40 million people in modern slavery today. And as you can see on that, um, Zach, if you could pull up that demographic slide, really interesting looking that women and girls are 71% of the victims. So that means that, you know, almost three out of every four victims of modern slavery who are in modern slavery are women, as if women didn't have enough problems. <laughs> Uh, also to see something that I found really sad was the, the graph on the left that says age at the time trafficking began and the majority are, were minors, right? So thinking about the fact of somebody being pulled into sex trafficking or labor trafficking when they are 17, 16, 15, 14, 12, really, really sad. I mean, to rob that person of their childhood at such a young age and pull them into this dark web. Um, you can also see that U.S. citizens and permanent residents made up 2,000 of human trafficking victims. And this was 2019 data from, I believe, from the Polaris Project. Uh, and so it's not just foreign nationals that are trafficked within the U.S. There's a fair amount of U.S. citizens as well. So, you know, if you're thinking it's just, you know, people from outside the U.S., that's not the case at all. Native American women are at particular risk. In 2016, a reported 506 Native American women disappeared or were killed in American cities. Now, add this on top of the fact that these poor Native American women we talked about last week, that either half up to 75% of Native American women have been raped or sexually assaulted, some of them more than once. Native American women, the, the disappearance of Native American women is really, really scary, and a lot of them are pulled into trafficking rings. Do, do, do. Uh, there's also the issue of back page. 73% of 10,000 child sex trafficking reports it received per year involved ads in back page. Craigslist a long time ago got rid of uh, human trafficking or got rid of uh, sex ads, but now 
back page is still having some, so that's something interesting to see. Also just looking, this is just from the Polaris project from 2019, the amount of uh, reports of human trafficking they had, and this was just from the, the United States. And you can see if you add up all the numbers together, you're at almost 50,000 trafficking related contacts to the Polaris project. So this is not a small issue. This is a big freaking issue. So I want to bring on Diana. Oh, and you can show that last uh, graph, Zach, that shows that. So I want to tell you a little bit about Diana, because if there's an expert in um, in this, it's more Diana than me. Uh, one more quick thing is that where is trafficking happening the most in the United States? Zach, if you could bring up that map, that would be fabulous. California, Texas, and Florida have by far the highest numbers of trafficking cases. So just something to think about, obviously, Texas being near the border and the trafficking of um, Mexican women is extremely high, but then, you know, and California as well. But what's going on in Florida? So looking at those states, you know, what's going on there? So if there's any expert in human trafficking, it's actually not me. I know you're shocked. It is Diana Mao. Uh, so Diana is the president and co-founder of the Nomi Network, and she is a standout leader in the movement to abolish slavery. The Nomi Network is a nonprofit that creates economic opportunities for survivors and women at risk of human trafficking. Prior to her tenor at Nomi, she was in economic development, microfinance, and M&A. So this is like one of those people that actually used to make money and then realized that she really wanted to save the world. And so super appreciative that Diana got out of finance and got into uh, saving women from human trafficking. Just so freaking awesome. She's also won about a million awards. She's a presidential leadership scholar, the co-chair of the Nexus Human Trafficking Modern Day Slavery Workgroup, writes for the Huffington Post, Reuters, and the United States Chamber of Commerce Business Civic Leadership Center. She also received the Pioneer Award. She has a BA in business economics from UC Santa Barbara and a master's degree in public administration and management from NYU. So I'm gonna bring Diana in. Hi, Diana. Welcome to the show. Hi, Samantha. Thank you so much for having me. And you know a lot about anti-human trafficking. So uh, I just, you know, it's and the thing is, it's like I remember working for this organization and we were in New York City and seeing the reports of how many kids were being trapped in Queens. Yeah. And, and for so many people, it just, was, you know, I lived in Manhattan, but it was like, I can't even remember. I was thousands of, of women in Queens and girls. And I was like, this is happening like three stops away on the subway. Yeah, in our backyards. It's right. It's very hidden, but if you look, you'll see it everywhere. How do especially you think, in New York City. Yeah, how do you think it stays just so it's so hidden? Like how, how is it just so behind the scenes? Yeah, I mean, I would say like those that are vulnerable or in slavery do not raise their hands to be counted. There's no census. Mm. So you know, there are massage parlors, as you mentioned, and nail salons that oftentimes will serve as illicit. Um, will have a, a facade, but they conduct illicit business activity, which includes um, sex trafficking, which includes prostitution. And so in these ethnic pockets, especially in New York City, where there's, you know, hundreds of different cultures merged into Manhattan, you know, you'll find a lot of hidden pockets of human trafficking. And I myself, uh, being a New Yorker, really up until last year, uh, when I left New York, actually, I was targeted. I was called a coronavirus at night walking home near Central Park. Oh, wow. That led me to question if I would be safe in New York. And after living there for 12 wow. years, I decided to move out of New York City. So Wait, anyhow, that's stop, stop for one second. You moved out of New York because of kind of not feeling safe as an Asian American? Yeah, I, well, beautiful. one night, um, actually this time, around this time in March, I was walking home after a business trip in DC. So I had my little carry on and I decided not to hop in an Uber and just take the subway. So I was walking along Central Park back home and um, a tall man, he was wearing a hoodie and had a beard. Um, he started following me and calling me a coronavirus. And then of course I'm a runner. Mm -hmm. So I started walking really, really fast yeah. you know, <laughs> with my little suitcase and just ignoring him. When frankly, I wanted to confront him and mm. you know address that, but because of the power dynamic, the fact that yeah. he was much bigger than I, it and it was at safe. night, it wasn't just safe. simply wasn't safe, and it was a battle I didn't want to fight at that time. So I chose to um, spend some time at my friend's house, which led in Kansas City of all places, and ended up staying there for long term. 
um, wow. just because I didn't feel safe and hopefully things will get better there now. Oh my goodness. You know, my, my roommate right now is uh, Asian American as well. And she doesn't even want to go visit New York because she's mm. heard the stories of box cutters in the face and just yeah. all sorts of stuff. And it's like, yeah. I think, I think that's where, you know, white privilege, you really do think like sometimes I'm targeted in New York because of a woman, but right. from a white privilege perspective, it's just like, wow, I wouldn't be like, Oh, I'm not going to New York for the weekend. Cause I'm afraid I'm going to be the victim of a hate crime. Yeah. You know, like, like the, the ability that, that we have as white people just to travel without having to think about that, at least within the United States. Honestly, it feels statistically less safe for me to be living in New York City as an Asian female. Um, and that's very sad because I went to NYU and lived there 12 years. <laughs> you know, I love the city, but that's the reality, sadly, in the day we, you know, the era we live in right now. And it's so and it's so weird because New York is just so diverse. You wouldn't expect that of New York. You know, it's usually exactly. people that are more tolerant, not more intolerant. Yeah. Um, exactly. So so let's go first and talk about. So, you know, you've been the victim of somebody saying slurs to you. Right. Mm -hmm. um, many others have been the victim of violence. And then all of a sudden, kaboom, this 21 year old loser walks into massage parlors and just murders these women in cold blood that are just there, you know, trying to make a living. What, what was your kind of thought when that happened of like, holy crap? I was shocked. I was angry. I was sad um, because I know, you know, being in the anti-trafficking community and, you know, along the line of alongside Polaris project studying these, ethnic enclaves of massage parlors, nail salons. Like I know the profile of women that choose these workplaces. And I can't say that, you know, the, the massage parlor um, where the incident happened was, um, you know, a cover up for sex trafficking. But I can say that women that are minorities, Asian, they do not have much agency in those circumstances. Mm. So if they are groped, if they are touched inappropriately, um, they don't have the wherewithal to stand up for themselves. Mm. And of course, in an established facility, it's a little bit different. Um, the, the facilities you and I visit are much different than the one that you saw, you know, in the news uh, broadcasted. And so with that, um, you know, it just really broke my heart because it made me wonder you know, what their profiles were, where they're from. And then since then, I've been reading a lot of stories. You know, one woman, Korean woman, her son posted um, about his mom being the sole provider for the family as a single mm -hmm. mother. So you hear more and more stories of the victims. And initially reading um, and hearing about the shooter's profile being a sex addict, um, you know, I feel like in media, sometimes there's this, really like miss um, <laughs> diagnosis of who the victim truly is, which is very common human trafficking as well. Human trafficking, mm -hmm. women are called prostitutes as opposed mm -hmm. to prostituted. You know, girls that are 13 do not choose prostitution. They're prostitutes. Right. And so I think we really have to reframe that and telling stories we need to really really think about who is actually the victim, um, whether it be law enforcement, you know, being on the front lines or a judge or media, I think it's very important to really tell that story appropriately. Right, and then I mean, and then there's clear problems that if it's called prostitution and then someone gets, you know, arrested on prostitution charges. And I know some of these laws have changed where they you know, are now trying to arrest the pimp instead of arresting the prostitute, but then, you know, they have a criminal record and then they can't get a job and then it's like, well, what, what do I do? Um, exactly. So, you know, I know that a lot of these women get into these kind of cyclical circles because of somebody else exploiting them. Yeah, it's a vicious cycle. You're exactly right. It's a vicious cycle of being lured, you know, from Malaysia. I know uh, a survivor who's become a friend of mine um, in the 90s, she was lured in into the hotel industry, promised a job that would pay $10,000 a month working for a hotel mm. um, through a recruiter that recruited her into Chicago. And from that moment she arrived in the United States, she experienced rape over and over again, being trafficked from uh -huh. Chicago to New York to 
Florida, all over, you know, this network. And finally, she escaped, um, I believe, when she was in a brothel in New York City. Wow. And, you know, and that's, you know, to go back to what you were saying earlier about that women don't can't do anything when they're groped and things like that. The only reason that this got attention was because they were murdered. Right. I, I, I'm sure that so many of these women have to be assaulted or, you know, any of those things. And yet, especially if they're, um, you know, if they're not citizens of the U.S. or if they don't speak the language or even if they have those things, right? Power dynamics. Yep. Is there any justice for them in that framework of like, if, you know, if it's not murder, can they, can they get anywhere in terms of getting justice if they're assaulted? I hate to say this, but, you know, I had an incident myself, actually, when I was walking home one night <laughs> and I saw a girl who actually was white um, and she was with um, a man that was much older that did not look like her brother, her family member. And when she was walking out of the subway, she looked like she was kind of on drugs. She was probably like 13 years old, very short and wow. very developed. And she was leaning and falling. And I wanted to help her, but this man, again, was bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. So what I did immediately was I, um, I discreetly took some photos um, because mm -hmm. in my kind of anti-trafficking world, and then I called the anti-human trafficking hotline right away. As soon as like they were mm -hmm. out of sight, but still in sight, I called. And then they could not do anything unless it would literally would have to be a citizen arrest. And then I called the Center of uh, Missing and Exploited Children. Same. Literally, wow. I would have to put myself, <laughs> insert myself off of my speculation, my gut instinct as a practitioner in anti-human trafficking in order to save her. And frankly, I'm a female and it's late and you have who knows if he had a gun, you know? So right. I would have to put myself, insert myself. Wait, so, so, so like, like, they wouldn't come arrest him? They were just like, no, or they wouldn't even come arrest him? No, there, there's not enough wow. evidence until I confront him about the situation. Wow. And in fact, that was, or, or she was being, um, you know, violently, being violently assaulted. Like, yeah, right, right, right. Violently assaulted. But, you know, someone that you can clearly tell she's on drugs, incoherent with a man more than twice her age. Right. I, I, my gut instinct, you know, and so I called yeah. and that's something that they will investigate, but there's just no, not enough concrete evidence. So to answer your question, sadly, I don't think our legal system has that bandwidth to identify um, victims of human trafficking, frankly, until I think it's too late. Mm. I mean, some courts still call women prostitutes, child prostitutes, which you can imagine there's, there's no, such, no such thing as a child, child prostitute. prostitute. Yeah. So <laughs> until we get the terminology right, I think we have a long way to go. Yeah. Do you, you know, you know, what are, you mentioned, okay, sorry, I'm all over the place. I have so many questions. I'm just like, which question do I ask first? Um, so one of the things that the Trump administration did was they removed funding for legal services for trafficking victims. Um, did you know if any of that, you know, has hurt trafficking victims in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, from the U.S. perspective, I know that there was funding allocated to other services. Um, but in terms of legal, like, status and work authorization, uh, it definitely is something that's very important. And... A lot of times survivors who are undocumented, they need mm. a T visa, they right. need basic rights. Um, they also need work authorization, otherwise they're back in a homeless shelter or desolate. And mm. so yes, I mean, legal service is a huge challenge for this population. And as a whole, there's just not enough resources, you know, um, for survivor care. So yes, I would say that we need to invest more <laughs> as a government into survivor services. Yeah, and the Trump administration also changed the requirements to get a T visa, which allows victims to stay in the US, get government benefits and put them on track to be US citizens. So victims, you know, as of I'm not I don't think Biden's done anything about this yet, had to, you know, prove their ordeal or or potentially yeah. be deported. Yeah, I mean, and it's very difficult to prove 
you know, when a victim is being interviewed by law enforcement and being pressured and asked really tough questions, if the interview process is not trauma informed, yeah. the victim is going to break because they need an advocate in the interview process. Mm. Because imagine if you were grilled by a police officer um, and you don't really speak English, what that would lead to mm. in terms so of the scary. interrogation process. Yeah. So then it's hard for them to be verified as a victim if there's behavior that appears mm. anxious. But of course, if someone who is undocumented had their passport taken away from them, you know, coming from Korea, from China, from Vietnam, yeah, they're going to be scared when they're interrogated by law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, obviously, and 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 you think about the way. I mean, I hate to say it, but I mean, even myself, I went for you know, sexual assault to New York City Police Department. And they were like, "Oh, he sounds like a jerk," but uh, you know the DA is never going to take your case. We had this case where this woman was gang raped and there were witnesses and they didn't even win. So you got no case. And, it wow. was just like, and I'm like a white woman. And the only reason I ended up in law and order, law, I just go to law and order at SVU was because I was a white woman who spoke English and my sister's a lawyer. And my sister then was like, actually this statute, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then like, I went to SVU. I caught the guy on the phone talking about what he did. And, um, and the DA never contacted me. And like, that's like oh, as a white woman, so right? Yeah, you, know, you can like, imagine. Yeah. First, I'm so sorry for that experience. That's horrifying. And it, you know, a city like New York City, you would expect differently as well, right? But um, that's sadly the case. And from somewhere of privilege, you can imagine what it would be like for someone that frankly doesn't even know how to use the subway system. Yeah. It'd be very challenging to navigate that. Uh, I remember trying to navigate the subway system in Japan and I was in the subway and I like was trying to buy a ticket and then I like went to the thing and then this man popped out of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little cuckoo's nest. He was like, and he started yelling oh at me in Japanese and I was like, I don't know what I'm like, what I'm trying to, cause I don't read the symbols. Like I can make yeah. it out in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, why is he yelling at me? So I start to go again. He starts to yell at me again. And I finally figured out it was because uh, like a really nice Taiwanese man was like, you're at the wrong station to go where you want to go. That's what he's trying oh, to tell you. Oh my gosh. And this Taiwanese guy like walked me to the other station, which was like 15 minutes away. I love Taiwanese people. They're the best. I'm um, half Taiwanese though. Are you really? We, oh. we definitely have this before going. <laughs> I love Taiwanese people. I like, you guys are awesome. Just like so nice, oh, so helpful, yes. so yes, sweet. We are. Um, good hearts. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's my ridiculous experience. But yeah, it, it must be really difficult. And and how do you, you know, do that? We do have a question from the audience. Uh, one of our audience members asks, how can you spot a place that has human trafficking going on without confronting anyone? And I think you're asking too, like, how can you re report it? Is that also maybe the, the question, I think, too? Like, how do you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah. Well, um, I mentioned seeing a girl, you know, without agency. Um, another instance, I was uh, going to the Amtrak station. I saw a girl with her pimp on the floor, and I reported that to the NYPD. And so when you become more open and you hear things and you see, um, for example, you know, at a hospital, someone who is being taken in, you know, doctors are on the front line because a lot of times the women, they need care. They've been abused so much mm -hmm. and they're taken to the hospital by their pimps and the person is adamant about staying with her. You know, mm -hmm. the control of... I think we lost Diana for a second. So we were just they, talking about... Yep. Yeah, and secondly, I would, oh, sorry. Um, secondly, I would say that when you're visiting a nail salon, a massage parlor, and you see cameras, mm. you know, at these awkward positions everywhere, you know, you see cameras in the back, you see cameras facing the door, outside in case police come so they can like kind of clean things up and shutters that block out light and you can't see anything, dark rooms. Um, I mean, those sometimes could actually be facades for illicit activity as well. In mm -hmm. fact, I believe Polaris Project has taken the liberty of mapping out some of these illicit facilities. 
uh, nail wow. salons, massage parlors, and other illicit businesses. Wow. So if you Google it, you know, you can probably find a lot of data even on Yelp in terms of uh, customers and citizens like alerting others about that. And then, you know, so say, you know, you see somebody at Port Authority on the floor, you know, you, you've said that you called NYPD once, but then you called somewhere else once. How do you figure out like, who are you going to call? Yeah. I mean, I feel like the second time I got a bit smarter because the second time was more recent and I knew I couldn't. So I was at Penn Station and I just saw a police stand, you know, at Penn Station in New York. There's mm -hmm. actually law enforcement everywhere. And so there that's was a true. stand and then they said to call the precinct um, that's Penn Station is within that precinct. So I just called that phone number and I described this circumstance. I described, it was really early in the morning. It was like 6.30, mm -hmm. I believe. And so I just told them exactly right in front of Duane and Reed. This is where they're playing, right on the floor there. Even the Duane and Reed cashier knew because I, I pointed that out to her and she's like, girl, what happens in Penn Station stays in Penn Station or something like where it was almost like acceptable oh that like, don't like kind of like mind your own business what happens down here because you know there's a lot of homeless population there's just a lot of things that happen you know at Penn Station and so she basically was like kind of you know like she sees it all the time basically so mm -hmm. that was um yeah and then how do you so you know something that I have had trouble with is that how do you del, you know delineate between because there's also this movement for sex workers to you know be able to do sex work and that it's an okay profession and legalization in certain places with STD tests like how do you differentiate between victims of sex trafficking and people who are choosing sex work. But like obviously we know if someone's a minor, they're not choosing sex work, right? But what are the other delineating factors that you think there are? Yeah, I really go back to the kind of high level of the definition of human trafficking, those who are forced, coerced to work with no pay. Mm -hmm. So no are little pay, no are non-consequential non pay. So I go back to that definition. I would say, you know, you have many, many survivors who I spoke with, both U.S. and, and global traffic in the U.S. Um, that have expressed those attributes and define themselves as survivors of sex trafficking. Um, and then, of course, I've also met a few women that have chosen sex work. And so I would say, you know, when it comes to really being able to to see whether it's by choice or by force, I would I would go to that definition. Mm. What are your thoughts about the fetish fetishes? I can't pronounce this word. Fetishization of Asian women and how you know this might have contributed to this, or just in general that kind of phenomena. Yeah, there is a hypersexualization of Asian women in our culture. Um, the idea that Asian women are submissive, are docile, are obedient, um, are you know, exotic. Um, so, so yeah, I would say, you know, it's a question of supply and demand. So in these communities, you know, of course the demand will know that you can find Asian Latino women um, in a massage parlor that's tucked away somewhere, you know, in Atlanta. I don't know, <laughs> you know, like that's sort of the, the question of supply and demand. And sadly that culture um, really breeds um, a more violent, um, hidden culture of human trafficking and sexual violence as well. Mm -hmm. One thing that I thought was interesting as I was reading a CNN article, and there's been all these protests, you know, against anti-Asian hate since this happened. And one man said, it's an awakening moment for Asian Americans to stand strong, to stand up and raise our voice and participate in social justice movements. And then he said, and I want your perspective on this. He said, many Asian Americans tend to avoid those kinds of things. It's not our business. We're just focusing on our survival, but this is an awakening for us. Do you think that's accurate that, you know, Asian Americans aren't as involved in social justice or is that just his perception? From my perspective, mind you, I'm one person. I would say that is accurate. Um, coming from a family with, um, and friends, peers that are high capacity leaders with uh, major intergenerational trauma coming from the Korean War, from the mm. rise of communism in China that led to like parents being interned in labor camp. Awful. Um, it, it, you know, some of what I'm sharing is my personal and friend stories. 
Yeah. That is our parents. So that does carry over. So by the time our parents, you know, being uh, born in the U.S. first generation, yes, there is, you know, our parents are trying to survive and make it in this country. So most likely our parents are the ones actually taking these vulnerable jobs, you know, mm -hmm. because they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. So in the food industry where they're getting paid $3 an hour, you know, yeah. et cetera. So, yeah, they are taking these jobs that are, um, there's also labor trafficking, of course, and um, unfair, unethical labor. And so, yes, I would say, but however, I would say my generation, the following generation, it's more like actualization, realization, and having the wherewithal, the economic stability, the education to be able to stand up to these battles. But yes, our mm -hmm. parents' generation, they're, um, I would say, based on my immigrant family and others among my peers, um, that's the story, you know, is just coming into this country and trying to survive. Yeah, absolutely. I just remember writing a paper in college about the Japanese American internment and how after the Japanese American internment, there was not a huge outcry by the Japanese American community. It was kind of like seen as like shameful and just like they wanted to be back assimilated and be normal Americans. But then it obviously affected their ability to get reparations and to get justice. Um, for that horrible period of internment during World War II. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Your 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 um, observation is absolutely correct. But I do see now, um, specifically with the shooting, that so many Asian American celebrities, um, sports figures, um, news anchors have risen to the top. Do I count as a news anchor? <laughs> I'm going to pretend that I count as a news anchor while Diana comes back to us. Diana, come back to us. Diana, come back to us. Uh, and, you know, for those of you who don't know, the Japanese American internment was a period of time where the U.S. was terrified of Japan and there was all this stigma against Japanese people uh, because Japan was, you know, had attacked Pearl Harbor. And so they rounded up all of these Japanese people who were Americans uh, and put them in internment camps in the middle of nowhere, you know, let them take one bag, all of their property and their businesses and everything just had to be given up. And they were put in these like dusty internment camps for, you know, I, I can't remember how long it was, but a couple of years and people, because basically Americans were xenophobic and were scared of them. Um, so hopefully uh, Diana will come back to us in one second. There she is. Hi again, Diana. Hi, my my apologies. I'm having some bandwidth issues in my office. <laughs> That's okay, no worries. Um, so I want to move on just because we don't have much time left with you and just ask you about your work. So what is the Nomi Network? What are you up to? Yeah, yeah. So on the topic of economic opportunity and really how important and critical it is, especially for survivors and women at risk of human trafficking, my organization provides economic opportunity for survivors through our training programs in India and Cambodia and now the US. India, um, you mentioned, Samantha, there are over 40 million people in slavery. Half of the population of those in slavery are in India. So we have That's seven training funny. centers in, yeah, exactly, in rural India. And we target trafficking hotspot areas. So in India, it's a northern states, rural, they don't have potable water, elect running electricity. Mm. Um, there's systematic violence against women and girls in Bihar and the states that we work in. In Cambodia, we're in Phnom Penh and Phuket, Pet, another trafficking hotspot near the Thai border. Mm. And in the US, you mentioned Texas being um, one of the third uh, most prevalent states in the US with cases of human trafficking. And we're launching actually a program in Dallas um, and helping girls 13 to 17 who are caught up in detention. Some of them have been brought in accounts of prostitution. Um, we're giving them opportunities, mentors, and internship placements. Wow, how did you decide to, to, to do, I mean, as your first place in the US and first thing to do, how did you A, like pick the criminal justice system versus some other, and, and you know, these young women to focus yeah. on? No, sadly, I don't know if you've traveled to India, you know, you could go to Mumbai, you can go to Calcutta and see 10,000 girls sold every night on the street visibly. <sighs> Um, in the US, we asked ourselves that same question, you know, where are the women and girls? And you mentioned some stats from Polaris Project, but the the numbers are much higher than that because mm -hmm. human trafficking, particularly juveniles, among juveniles, 
it, it really is um, up the pipeline that feeds into human trafficking for the youth population is homelessness, uh, girls aging out of foster care, runaway youth. And with runaway youth particularly, a lot of times they're on the streets by themselves and they end up caught in the detention system for, for crimes of survival. Um, these are not crimes. These are not violent crimes or crimes for survival. So we're um, leveraging the justice system and helping us identify these girls that are highly vulnerable or already sadly have been trafficked to help them get back on their feet and stabilize their family situation, help them get on education and career path. And so that's the goal. And we are really excited because I've gotten to know some of the girls, hear their stories, and it's really critical. This is a population that's widely ignored in our country. But Can you tell us one story? Yeah, one girl, um, her mother works as a housekeeper. She's undocumented. She makes $1,000 a month and cares wow. for her and her sibling. And so with that, she has boyfriends that kind of help stabilize their, their income that are in wow. and out of her family. And she was sexually abused by a boyfriend of her mother's, ran away and ended up committing a crime that led to her detention. Um, she's in a facility that's more rehabilitation center because okay. of the story I share, the judge you know, recognizes that she's a victim, not committing a heinous crime. Right, right, um, right. So that's just one of many stories of really um, the need, not just for our type of program, but also to help her with housing and other needs because she's not able to go back to her family. Wow, wow. Uh, it's just so, so sad. Um, and you can just so, you know, it's so easy to see that these crimes are such, you know, they're situational and they're survival. And it's like, yeah. what do you do? Um, so lastly, and then I'm going to let you go because I know you're a busy woman. Oh, thank How you. can the audience support you and the work that you're doing? Yeah, well, first, thank you for sharing, uh, Samantha, our website. Uh, please sign up for our listserv. We share updates about our trainees, about their lives and their progress and their stories as well. Um, and then we have just a lot of resources to be engaged. And then also, I would say there's many ways to get involved and spread the word about the Nomi's of the world. Nomi is a survivor who I met back in 2008. She was seven years old when she was trafficked. Oh my and, God, that breaks my and, heart. I can't, that like breaks my heart. That's so sad. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. In Cambodia, there's girls as young as five years old. And the network oh. are, you know, people like myself, Samantha and you. So there's so many ways you can share our story and our work through social media. And then also our annual report, um, encouraging others to read about our impact. So. Right, and I Thank also you. saw you have a store where you can buy stuff, right? Yes, we have a store that's connected to the website and these products are made um, from some of our trainees and graduates out of our fashion school and incubator in Cambodia. And some of the stuff I will say is actually pretty cute. I just bought a mask. <laughs> oh, I, I love it. It's like really Thank cute. You. It's like striped and yeah. like backpacks and like wallet holders. Like I was like, I like this. Like I should have bought it before Thank the you. show and it. Oh, but, um, too late. Uh, but yeah, yeah thank I think you so much. Stuff, so you'll well, have to sport it and send us a picture of you. Yeah, it. I absolutely will. Uh, well, yeah. it's been a delight, Diana. I really want to thank, thank you. you. I don't want to express, you know, my solidarity with you as a, you know, amazing woman leader, but also an Asian American woman and for, you know, being resilient and continuing to do the work that you do even under duress. Yes, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be on your show. And I look forward to staying in touch with you, Samantha. <laughs> Okay, Take I'll talk care. to you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Well, everyone, that was Diana Mao. She is the president and co-founder of the Nomi Network, which works to alleviate human trafficking uh, in the U.S. and in Asia by helping women uh, provide pro provide them with economic, um, like she was saying, internships, mentors, uh, fashion training. They actually have like a fashion incubator where they train women uh, in fashion skills and then they make stuff that they then sell. I mean, it's great because they really look and see that poverty is the root of a lot of human trafficking. Um, you know, w girls who are sold in trafficking it comes from poverty. So what an amazing interview. So delighted to have her. So I want to switch gears now and I want to talk about guns.
fun stuff. I know the show is so light. So my original title for this show was guns, human trafficking and other light topics, but I decided not to use that. But I know this is tough stuff. So thanks for hanging in. It's really sad stuff, but it's just so important because so much of the stuff stays hidden. And the only time it comes out is when there's a mass murder. But all of the women that are sexually assaulted in these types of spas and massage bars and are trafficked, we just have no idea about. So it's just so important to know and to support work like Diana's. Uh, another amazing woman, Hasina Karba. She does amazing work on human trafficking in India, uh, runs the Impulse NGO. There's another amazing woman who has uh, created an NGO that trains truck drivers to recognize the signs of human trafficking and to be able to report that. There's another program to educate airline staff. So there is an awareness of this now of how to, um, how to recognize it and then how to report it. But it's, it's difficult as Diana was saying, you know, especially if you're a woman, you know, to confront a pimp who may be carrying a gun is like, Ooh, not exactly like what I would want to do, uh, but to be able to recognize those signs and then call the right people is incredibly important. So, you know, I, I encourage you to just, you know, be aware, look, look at what's surrounding you. If a situation looks weird, if a, a child looks very young and they're with someone that's clearly not their father and they look like they're drugged, could be human trafficking. Please report it. So I want to move over to more fun stuff, which is another mass shooting because we live in America. And you know, not funny. There's a mass shooting almost every day in America. I, I, and it's, it's freaking wild. It, there has been, let me just look at the stat. The number of mass shootings in the US this year has already reached 103 as of March 22nd. So we heard about Atlanta, we heard about uh, Colorado, but mass shooting is defined as the murder of four and or more people. So there's so many mass shootings every day that we just don't hear about since, uh, let's see, so there, in addition to the Atlanta, Georgia mass shooting, there was also a mass shooting in Stockton, California. The next day, five people who were preparing a vigil in California's Central Valley shot in a drive-by shooting. There was a shooting in Gresham, Oregon. Four victims were taken to the hospital after a shooting in the city east of Portland. There was a mass shooting on Saturday, March 20th in Houston, Texas. Five people were shot after a disturbance inside a club. There was a mass shooting in Dallas the next day. Eight people were shot by an unknown assailant, one of whom died. There was a mass shooting in Philadelphia on March 20th. One person killed and another five injured during a shooting at an illegal party. And then we wake up on March 22nd and 10 people are killed at the supermarket, picking up their prescriptions, buying some groceries, bagging groceries, just going to work. You know, it's just it's just so unconscionable that people can go into normal situations and have to worry about getting murdered. It just it doesn't it doesn't make sense. And it's not it's not necessary. So as we said, 10 people were murdered in cold blood at a grocery store in Colorado. The 21 year old suspect was armed with a handgun and a military style semi-automatic rifle. And he was wearing a tactical vest when he carried out the attacks. Whenever it says that somebody's wearing like a tactical vest, that really shows me that these men who go in and something like 98% of mass shooters uh, are, are men. Uh, they think that they're some kind of hero. They think that they're on some military mission and journey. The same with the Sandy Hook killer. He was wearing tactical gear or camo. Like he thinks he's like some, you know, military hero. I kind of want to be like, hey, you want to, you know, you want to use a gun? Go enlist in the Marines. Have a great time. You know, go deploy and protect our country. <laughs> Why do you have to walk into a place and shoot 10 people trying to get groceries? Oh, it just makes me so upset. So, Zach, if you could put up that uh, that little slideshow that is just so sad. And again, I'm sorry that this is so sad, but it just is. Since Sandy Hook in 2012, there have been more than 2,500 mass shootings. 2,500. So I don't know if you remember that day when the Sandy Hook children were killed. It was a time where, like, you, you, it was just so hard to believe that little children could go to school 
And um, I'm from New Fairfield, Connecticut. My younger sister is multiply handicapped. She went to a disabled program at Newtown High School, which was just down the road. And I kept thinking, if that guy walked into Newtown High School, my sister can't walk. So I, she would have been gunned down within two seconds. And I just remember thinking, I'm so glad she's not there. But you know, all these little kids that you see, these adorable children that A, someone could go in and shoot them, but even worse, that Congress couldn't pass anything. It's just like, what has to happen in order for Congress to pass gun control legislation? It is just so horrifying. And, you know, looking at this, like, I feel like I'm going to cry and they're not even my kids. And I've met some of the parents of the Sandy Hook victims. And it is just heartbreaking to have your six-year-old go to school and then not come back. And then when we look at the, the, the things that kids have to do in school now to train for mass shooting, you know, they, they have mass shooter drills. They have to hide under their desk. How terrifying is that? And then the kids that were there and that weren't killed are still in massive amounts of therapy. I mean, how terrifying is that? So why? What, what, what is the deal? Like, how could this happen? How could Congress do nothing? And why are there so many mass shootings in America? So I want to dive into that a little bit. So Zach, if you could just, uh, Zach's my lovely producer, if you could just pop up that next slide of the bar graph. So if we look at firearms for 100 residents, if you look right there at the top bar, US, 120 firearms per 100 residents. That means we have 20 more firearms per 100 residents than people. So we have more guns in the US than we do people. In addition, Americans make up 4.4% of the global population, but we own 42% of the world's guns. The world. 31% of mass shootings worldwide from 1966 to 2012 were committed by Americans. Zach, if you could put up that next graph, that would be great. So if we look, we can see that the, the number of guns is clearly correlated with the number of deaths per 100,000 people by homicide, right? I mean, you, you look at this and it's just embarrassing. It's like Switzerland, Canada, Croatia, Austria, they're all like hanging out over here in the left corner. And then it's like, oh, the United States all the way up here at the far end because we have so many gun related deaths. And I'm sorry, it's not just homicides, it's homicides and suicides and suicides are a large number of deaths by gun in the US as well. So if we look at the rest of the world, one, one of the reasons that I do this show is because there's such an America first mentality sometimes that we don't realize sometimes that we can learn from other parts of the world. Like Ruth Bader Ginsburg didn't realize that there could be gender equal laws in the US until I believe she was in Sweden and saw Oh wow, they have they have like equal pay. They have e they're equal on stuff here. Like what are we doing in the US? Like they're not able to see what's possible. And so if we look at all these other countries, they're obviously doing something right that we are not doing. It's I think it's also staggering that Yemen has been in a you know this crazy war for a while now. We had, we had a show on Yemen 2 weeks ago and they have less than half the guns that we have, right? And they're in active war. Like if anyone can make the argument for having a gun, it's somebody in Yemen who's like, my country is actively in war. Whereas the US is like, oh, my country's not at war, but I need my guns. So what's going on here? Uh, well, so there was a 10 year ban on assault weapons. So 85% of mass shootings in the US are committed with a semi-automatic weapon. So there was a 10 year ban on assault weapons that passed in 1994 that Joe Biden was a part of passing but it expired in 2004 and that was when George Bush was president we were you know uh in Iraq and so obviously George Bush and very military forward government that was never renewed if you look at the stats of okay did that assault weapon ban work it did mass shooting fatalities were 70% less likely to occur during the federal ban period. 70% less likely. So here it's like, oh, here's a solution. We tried it and it worked, but ah, whatever. We'd rather have guns. Still don't get it. We also need to look at the fact that 189 out of 194 mass shooters in the US have been male. What does this say about 
the influence of toxic masculinity on gun violence. You know, this, this, like we were talking about this masculine hero complex of like walking in and shooting people and also the anger with men. One of the things we need to stop doing is being like, oh, every mental, every mass shooter has a mental health problem. No, every mass shooter has a ton of anger that they clearly don't know how to express that they're then taking out on innocent human beings. Okay. It's not because they're schizophrenic. It's just, there's too many. And obviously if, you know, 189 of 194 mass shooters are male, there is something there, right? And so looking at that toxic, toxic masculinity that goes into mass shooting is extremely important and into the, you know, every time you hear mass shooting, it's like, are you surprised it's another dude? I'm not. So we really need to look at that and see how are we raising men? Why are they so angry? How, you know, how do they become so angry that they walk in and shoot people because they're having a bad day? It's terrifying. Uh, Zach, if you could pull up that next graph about suicide attempts. So I also want to make another really important point. I wrote an article a little while ago on male suicide uh, because a majority of the suicides in the U.S. are men. And actually, 60 percent of firearm injuries are not homicides. They are people who use their weapons against themselves. This stat, I'm sure, is higher now. It was 129 lives are taken by suicide every day in the US. I'm sure with COVID, as suicide rates have gone up and there's a huge mental health crisis with COVID, I'm sure that number has gone up. And the problem is that if you own a firearm, the likelihood of successfully committing suicide is just so much higher because a lot of suicides take place when, you know, during a moment of severe depression where, you know, there's a feeling of hopelessness but firearms are just so fatal. So if you own a firearm, there's no going back from shooting yourself in the head, right? If you, you're cutting, poison, trying to overdose, those things you could potentially recover. You don't recover from a gunshot wound unless you shoot yourself in the foot. So the lethality of firearms is just absolutely devastating. Uh, so, you know, you really want to think too, and there's reports of, of men walking into a gun store and literally walking out and shooting themselves in the head in the parking lot. I mean, this is like not great stuff. And the correlation of suicides with houses owning firearms is they're extremely correlated. Something else that's correlated is femicide. What does femicide mean? It means the murder of females. So female homicide put together. It's also correlated with that. And mass shooters actually one really predictive factor if we're going to look at also trying to unpack um, how to prevent these shootings in addition to background checks and all these other things mass shooters often have a history of violence against women zach if you could put up that slide that would be great so in more than half of mass shootings over the past decade Half, the perpetrator shot a current or former intimate partner or a family member as part of the rampage. Okay, so I just want you to think about that, that there's a clear link between men who have uh, committed domestic violence and their, you know, anger at a current partner, something that has to do with an intimate partner or a family member as part of their, you know, whole deal. Abusers with firearms are five times more likely to kill their victims. So now we're talking about domestic abuse. So domestic abuse is a, a predictor of mass murder, but it's also a predictor of intimate partner murder and femicide, right? It's not just mass shootings. It's predictive of that because again, the lethality of a firearm, you get drunk, you have a fight with your spouse, you're really angry, you know, and, you know, take the handgun out and that's it. They're dead. Every month, an average of 53 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner. Nearly a million women alive today, and this is in the U.S., have reported being shot or shot at by intimate partners. A million women. And 4.5 million women have reported being threatened with a gun by an intimate partner. It is being used as a tool of intimidation, of control, in the most horrific and horrifying ways. Can you imagine trying to get out of a marriage with somebody or divorce them or leave them when they have a gun? and they threaten you with a gun every time you say you're gonna leave? Uh, can you blame people for staying? It's unbelievable. So there is actually a law, a federal law that people that 
have a domestic violence record should not be able to get a gun. But it's not that simple. So it really comes down, state and local authorities actually have to get the guns out of people's hands. So they may not be able to pass a new background check at a licensed gun dealer, but what if they already had guns before they were convicted of domestic violence? Uh, how many places do people actually go and say, oh, do you have any guns from the past that you already had? And many of them do, that's how all these femicides happen and actually confiscate those guns. That does not happen very often. Uh, this is interesting too. Police are more likely to be injured or killed on domestic violence related calls than any other kind of call. So for those of you who care about police, there if a person owns a gun and it's a domestic violence related call, they are also more likely to be shot. Um, two, two, two. So only a handful of localities across America actually have the police go and search somebody who's convicted of domestic violence for guns and weapons and confiscate them. So that's not really, you know, great. Also, sometimes there's an assault put into the record, but it's not tagged as domestic violence. So when then they go to do a background check and this is assuming they do a background check, they don't see the domestic violence tag because it wasn't tagged correctly. The other problem you have is remember when the guy with um, who had been in the military and his domestic violence case had gone through the military system and that hadn't correlated with the US police system. So in the US, whatever police system, federal background check, he didn't have a history of domestic violence, but it's because the military hadn't logged it correctly or hadn't passed over the information. So there's also information sharing that messes this stuff up. So it might not be detected. Uh, Zach, if you could put up that next statistic. So 92% of all women killed with guns in high income countries, this is a 2015 statistic, were from the United States. 92%. So your likelihood to be killed with a gun as a woman is way higher in the US than it is in Sweden, Norway, Finland, Germany, I mean, a host of other high income countries. It, it, that's scary. And, you know, it really reminds me of a guy who I met when I was living in Spain and we were in a cab and he was the Uber driver. And he said, I came from a country at war and, you know, I, I, I would like to go to the U.S. I'd like to live in the U.S., but it seems like there's a mass shooting every day there and I don't want to go to another country in war. Like this is how the outside world is perceiving us, that we are pathetic. We are pathetic. Whenever you talk to Europeans, they are just like, what is wrong with America and guns? They don't get it. They're like, what? why does everybody need a gun? What is the big deal? And I don't really get it either. But it's, it's, it's honestly, it's an embarrassment. It's really, it's embarrassment to America. It's embarrassment to our reputation. We've got to figure out how to put an end to this. You could also see, Zach, you can load up the next graph that intimate partner homicides of women by guns are on the rise. So they're actually going up. And again, looking at the amount of domestic violence that's happened during COVID, you'll see this is a 2017 statistic that um, that uh, it's probably continued to rise as domestic violence has risen and intimate partner violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. Women in the U.S. are 21 times more likely to die by firearm homicide than women in peer nations. I don't know. After this episode, I think I'm moving. I'm going to be really honest. Uh, so <laughs> what what else can we do? So what, what do we do about this? So right now, what is Congress trying to do? So House Democrats have already passed two bills this month that are looked at strengthening background checks for gun buyers by applying them to all gun buyers. And also making the time that the FBI has to vet those flagged by this instant national system longer. So, but most Republicans, as usual, say that, you know, I, I just, oops, I think my, my thing just died. Zach, can you hear me? Can you just give me a cue if you can hear me or no? Sorry, everybody. Mm. 
Okay. Zach, can you give me a cue if you can hear me? Oh, you can hear me now? All right, sorry everybody, The my headphones uh, turned off. Uh, so uh, back to what we were talking about. So Republicans don't wanna pass these things. Only eight House Republicans voted to advance the universal background check legislation, even though numbers are as high as 90% of Americans support universal background checks, even gun owners, because people who legally buy guns, they don't want guns in the hands of people that are gonna commit crimes because it's bad for them. Right. And they just just because they have a gun doesn't mean they don't care about safety. They just, you know, sometimes it's cultural. I can't pretend to really understand it, but they they want these universal background checks, too. So it's not like gun owners don't want these. Um, but for some reason, the Republicans are super hesitant to do anything. So right now, the, the bills will be brought to the Senate floor, but they're almost certainly not going to get the 60 votes needed to clear the filibuster in the Senate, which means that these bills will just basically hang in the air unless there's something done to either amend the filibuster requirements, like, for example, requiring all senators to stay on the floor like at all hours uh, to argue as part of the filibuster, which Biden is looking at amending the filibuster requirements, um, or if we eliminate the filibuster. Because right? it's, it's just, it's been so long that we've been trying to pass gun control in this country and it's just it's too it's just too long uh zach can you also can you put up that next slide that says states tighter gun control laws have fewer gun related deaths so there's also legislation that happens on a state level so for example connecticut passed a bunch of legislation that happened on the state level after sandy hook and so it's so obvious like this graph shows there's less gun related deaths in states with tighter gun control laws. I mean, it's, it's, there's just, there's no argument that could be like, oh, gun control laws don't work. No, actually, guess what? Here they do. Alaska actually is one of the highest numbers of gun violence, which is really sad and just awful. So let's see. What else can be done? So this is, so this was something interesting by, uh, well, so the Violence Against Women Act can be passed. That would be extremely helpful when it comes to domestic violence. And we also need to require abusers to relinquish guns they already have, just like we talked about. We need to close loopholes. So something called the Charleston loophole, which you think you've heard Biden talk about, which permits abusers to purchase guns without a completed background check if their background check isn't completed in three business days stupidest thing I ever heard. Like, oh, if, you know, this system doesn't, has anyone here like gone through anything that had to do with the government and background checks? It takes freaking forever. I mean, it is like not an easy, quick process. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to bet that like every person ends up being able to buy a gun. Just like, whose background check is done in three business days? Uh, the, the unlicensed sale loophole, which allows abusers to purchase guns from unlicensed private sellers without a background check. Uh, do, 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 do. What else can be done? Zach, if you could bring up that next slide about the bad Apple gun dealers. So something pretty interesting that the Brady campaign came out with that I thought I took a class in violence reduction strategies when I was at the Fletcher School, but it was at the Harvard Kennedy School and looked at a lot of like, how do you eliminate gun violence? And the Brady campaign came out with a really interesting um, study that showed that you can also go to the source, which is the gun dealers. And so they did a study that showed that 5% of gun dealers actually are supplying 90% of guns used in violent crime. So 5%. So their hypothesis is let's shut those dealers down or regulate them or figure out, you know, how to deal with this 5%. Like we used to say in our violence reduction class, you want to go to uh, you know, the hot people, the hot places, you know, to focus on violence reduction, you want to go to like those pockets of where things are the worst. And those stores are clearly the worst. And having that data is extremely valuable. Now, what are these bad Apple gun dealers? How do they do this? So this is something called straw purchasing. So that's when people 
pass background checks, but they're legally buying guns for somebody else. So they're not actually the recipient of the gun. They buy it, they get a good background check, and then they give it to someone else. Uh, gun trafficking, which is people who buy guns and then illegally resell them without a license because we can just illegally sell guns in the U.S. because that's okay. Uh, and illegally selling or otherwise providing guns off the books, which is dealers that transfer guns without even running a background check at all. So a lot of these bad apple gun dealers don't ask appropriate questions of the potential customers, don't gather enough information from customers to see if they would be responsible gun owners. I mean, this is not selling lingerie. You know, if you're selling somebody a pair of underpants, you don't need to get, you don't need to understand like what they're going to do with their underpants. If you're selling somebody a gun that could potentially you be used to hurt themselves and or others, there, there should be a, a, a minimum of, questioning of background checks of something to be able to, you know, but the problem is that incentivization is off because if they're not taken to task for selling all of these guns to people who then commit violent crimes, you know, this is a sale. Every salesperson wants to make a sale. They make more money if they make a sale. So if they determine someone can't buy a gun and there's no repercussion to them selling to a gun without a background check, then a lot of people who are motivated by money are going to do that. Oh, so Zach, can you put up that last slide? Which is the top sellers of crime guns in the country. So we, we know exactly what these gun shops are. Organize against them. You know, get the ladies that are really great at organizing at the abortion clinics. Tell them if they want to be pro-life. They should come organize in front of these gun stores to be much more valuable use of their time if they want to prevent people from being killed. Uh, and so, I mean, you can see them out there. Um, and also, there was an amendment that prevented uh, ATF from public publicly releasing or sharing data on crime gun traces. They used to be able to release this data, and they actually passed an amendment so that you couldn't get this information anymore about who the bad apple gun dealers were. To, to, to do. We also need to have the proposed equal access to justice for victims of gun violence act to allow bad apple gun dealers and gun manufacturers to be held liable for negligence and product liability. Right. Uh, some other interesting things with regards to gun control. Uh, you know, there have been some measures introduced in other countries where they don't allow the use of guns or uh, conceal and carry on a Friday and Saturday night because they know that that's when most people will be drinking and they're most likely to use their gun. That's been shown to be effective in one of the Latin American countries. Whew. So that was a mouthful. I'm exhausted. You know, I'm going on and on about this because I went to March for Our Lives this year. I did interview, or it was 2018, with all of these young people and they all they want is to stop having shootings in their school to not go to school scared that they're going to be shot and especially i talked to some young men of color and they were absolutely terrified of this you know usually the republican side of things saying oh well the solution is more guns and these young black men were saying fuck excuse me excuse my language like you know we already have to deal with racism like you know we don't want to be terrified that our teacher who is already potentially racist might shoot us because what because of racism like they were terrified of this concept of teachers having guns so this is such an important issue it makes us look pathetic to america and the rest of the world i want to be proud of our country i know you want to be proud of america too we've got to pass common sense gun reform it's called common sense because it really isn't that crazy. It is not super radical. We are not eliminating all guns in the nation. We are not buying back every gun. We are not saying you can't have guns anymore. We're just like, hey, let's make sure that if somebody buys a gun, they're not a risk to themselves or to others. Whew. So that is it for this week's episode of Samantha Politics. I really want to thank you for tuning in, for listening to me rant about gun control, listening uh, to Diana talk about the plight of human trafficking victims and what we can do about human trafficking. I also want to give a big shout out to my amazing producer, Zach, and stream inspectors. They're the ones who do all this fantastic, uh, you know, all these beautiful graphics that you see behind me and who make sure that the show... Um, 
goes according to plan and puts up all the slides. If you are interested in live streaming, check out Stream Inspect Inspectors. They are the best. Uh, I also want to put a shout out for the Women's Leadership Program that I'm running. One of them starts on Friday. Uh, it's full, but I'm running another Women's Leadership Program that starts on uh, end of April with women from around the world. And it's really talking about how can we come up with changes to problems like this? How do we move the needle on feminist issues? So Zach, if you could just put the link in the chat, that would be great. Next week's episode, we're gonna have our ambassador Cindy Corville back. She was the first uh, American, amb or American ambassador to the AU, the African Union, has had a long storied career. She's gonna be joining us with an activist from um, to talk about the genocide that's happening in Tigray, Ethiopia, which is not making US news much. So I wanted to cover it. So more fun, light topics to be had. Uh, yeah, so that's it for this week's episode of the Samantha Politics and I'll see you next week. Oh, wait, lastly, don't stop it yet. If you like this episode, you think it's important, share it with your friends, share it with your neighbors, share it with your Republican grandparents. Uh, you know, please like us on Facebook that helps us to get sponsors and uh, you know, and definitely tune in next week. So that's it for this week's episode.